It's so good to see each and every one of you. My name is Bill. I'm the lead pastor. If you're new with us, we're so glad that you're here. Don't you love this up here, the music? One of the things, yeah, it's amazing. One of the things I love is that we're a church that has an organ, and we have an organist, which is even more rare. That is Gail. And so whenever I can, I like to get, let Gail let loose. I say, open this up and make the windows rattle. So Gail, before you step down, give us a little, just, just a little organ. Would you join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts for God's word? Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we come with expectant hearts. Lord, as we look forward in Advent to the, to the celebration of uh, Christmas, that re- when your son came into the world, God, right now we come and we, with expectant hearts, open your word and we ask God that you would speak uh, to us, God, through your word. And so, Father, we love you and we thank you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Everybody said with me, amen. As Dave mentioned, Advent, uh, this year Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday, which uh, is kind of rare. And uh, what that means is, is that we have five candles and we're like, let's use that to our advantage and let's start Christmas a little bit early because who doesn't want to start Christmas early, right? Amen. So that we're using, taking that to our advantage. <clears throat> And again, we're so glad that you're here. If you are new with us, by the way, stop by our Welcome Center. As Tina said, we have a special gift for you uh, on the way out. Well, we are going to start a series called King of Kings leading up to Christmas. And we just finished a series called Who Made You King? In which we looked at the Old Testament kings of Israel. And uh, we spent uh, uh, about 13 weeks on that. And I hope your heart was encouraged. But the truth is that sermon series was never going to be complete unless we looked at the King of Kings. Amen. And so that is what this sermon series is all about. So be excited because if your heart was encouraged in a sermon series about fallen kings in the Old Testament, how much more will your heart be encouraged as we look at the true King of Kings in the New Testament? Amen. So we all know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a broken promise. And we'd all agree it's never fun. Now, generally speaking, the bigger the promise, the more painful it is when that promise is broken. But even small promises, when they're broken, sting. It hurts. It's a disappointment. Some of us, of course, know the sting of broken promises far more than others. In a room this size and with this many people watching online, I'm sure there are some of us that have felt the sting of broken promises all throughout our life, ever since childhood and all the way up till to today. And when I bring up the subject of broken promises, it can be a very sensitive subject for people. Now, the fact is we all know about broken promises because we live in the United States where there are politics. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. But yeah, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, uh, we all know that even our own political parties can be full of broken promises, right? Amen. The Bible, of course, is full of examples of broken promises. They're all throughout the Bible, and there are some doozies in there. But the one that jumped to my mind when I thought about, uh, as I was preparing this message, is recorded in the book of Genesis. And when I bring it up, you'll know what I'm talking about. Many of you will. It revolves around a man by the name of Laban who promised to give his wife Rachel to a man by the name of Jacob in marriage. But before giving his daughter Rachel in marriage, Jacob agreed to work for seven years for her. Now, I'm going to show you a verse, and this verse is the verse that I am convinced Hallmark uses as the basis for every movie that they make on the Hallmark channel. (laughs) So here, here it is. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Now listen to this. And they seemed to him but a few days because of his love, the love he had for her. And we all said, ah, that's the hallmark, ah, right? Now, 
Jacob serves seven years for her. He fulfills his end of the promise. I will work seven years if you give me her hand in marriage. However, when it came Laban's turn to fulfill his part of the promise, he doesn't do it. On the wedding night, when it comes time to consummate the marriage, Laban breaks the promise by substituting his older daughter, Leah, in place of Rachel. And in the morning, this happens. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Why have you broken your promise? Folks, can you even imagine being on the receiving end of a broken promise of this magnitude? Marrying, you you think you're going to get this lady here, I'm getting her. No, I got her sister. And then he ends up marrying, he he marries double into this family. He's He's got both sisters. Could you even imagine being on the receiving end of a broken promise of this magnitude? Now, some of you can, because some of you have been hurt by the sting of broken promises in severe ways in your life. And that's why I said, this is a sensitive subject that I'm bringing up. Now, here's the deal. Not only do we know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a broken promise, we all know what it's like to be the one who breaks a promise, right? We've all done that to other people, where we've said we'd come through, we'd do something, whatever it is, and we failed to deliver. But regardless of what side of a broken promise you find yourself on, broken promises, big and small, hurt. They sting. Now, the reason I tell you this is because one of the most encouraging characteristics of the God that we follow is this. He is the perfect promise keeper. He's a perfect promise keeper. Now, you all know that. You all know that. So I'm not telling you anything new. But that's so important because we live in a world full of broken promises. But we follow a God who never breaks his promise. And folks, that is so encouraging. Numbers 23 says this. God is not man that he should lie or the son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? By the way, do you know who wrote this or who said this? It was a guy by the name of Balaam. Balaam was a pagan sorcerer. A pagan sorcerer says this about God. Balaam was hired by a pagan king, the king of Moab, a guy by the name of Balak, He was hired to curse Israel. However, Balaam is moved by God to providentially not only exalt God, but bless Israel. So he's hired to curse Israel. He blesses Israel and he praises God, which just goes to show you, and this is very, very important. God is working all things out according to the purposes of his will in every generation. And you want to know why that's important? Here's why that's important. Because God is working out all things according to the purposes of his will in, any, in every generation, all the promises that God makes are promises that will come to pass no matter what stands before him. Even if a foreign godless king hires a pagan sorcerer to do his bidding, God gets his way. God is working out his purposes at all times and in all ways in every generation, which means his promises will always come to pass no matter how dire the situation might seem. Now, why is that important? Because, folks, we are living in a world that is off the chains, right? We're looking at a world that's out of control, and it's easy for us who are believers to go, is God going to deliver with the world the way it is? Isn't something going to thwart the purposes of God? No. But that also applies to your life and my life individually. There's nothing that's going to come into your life that's going to prevent God from fulfilling his purposes in your life, whatever that promise might be that you find in the pages of Scripture. No matter how dire the situation is, no matter what stands before you, God is a God that always delivers on his promises. And why is that so important? Here's why this is so incredibly important, given that we're in Advent is because time and again throughout the Old Testament, God promised to send a king who would sit on the throne of David forever. And we refer to this as the Davidic covenant or the Davidic promise. God made a promise to David. I'm going to raise up someday from you someone who will sit on your throne forever. So church, it's on that note, it's my honor to present to you the word of God today. We'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the Davidic covenant, the promise that God made to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up 
your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom, and say that last word with me, forever, forever. Again, church, hear the word of God, the Davidic promise. Of course, this promise is so significant, we see it in other pages places in the Bible. Psalm 89, three and four says this. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I made a promise to David. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Psalm 132, again, the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back because God never turns back on his promises. One of the sons of your body, I will set on your throne. I like that, a sure oath. Folks, that's what every one of God's promises are, a sure oath, a sure promise. It is guaranteed to happen. Now, you know what's so unique about the Davidic covenant? It's that little word forever that I had you say. Why is that important? Could you imagine David trying to wrap his mind around the fact that one of his descendants was going to sit on the throne forever over a kingdom that would last forever. I mean, he must have thought, wait, wait, wait. what promise did you just give me? One of my descendants is going to sit on, a, on the throne forever over a kingdom that lasts forever? David's mind must have been blown. He must have wondered, who in the world could this future descendant of mine be And how is this even possible? Now, remember, we have the advantage of being on this side of the cross, which means we have the answer key, right? The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. And so you and I have this advantage of going, we know exactly what that is. That's Jesus. Jesus is going to be God in the flesh who will sit on the throne forever over a kingdom that will last forever. It makes perfect sense to us. So many people, I talk to them, and I felt this way too, go, I wish I could have lived in biblical times. Do you really? Because, let me just say, they didn't have NFL back then. So that would have been difficult for some of you. And there was no golf either. No, but let me tell you why one reason you might not have wanted to live in biblical times. Because the Old Testament is full of promises, and they point forward to Christ. They're types and shadows in the Old Testament pointing forward to Christ. But they were types. They were shadows. They were hard to see. They were hard to understand. How could God possibly fulfill this promise? Like, here's a perfect example. How is a descendant from David going to sit on the throne forever? Well, you and I on this side of the cross know, oh my gosh, God sent his one and only sinless son into the world to die for the sins of men. He rose and sits, he rose and ascended. He sits at the right hand of God, the father almighty, and will rule and reign forever. That makes sense to us. And I like having those answers. Don't you like living at a time when you have those answers? I do. I don't know about you. But for everyone living before Christ, these promises, again, would have been hard to bring into focus. Now, here's where things get even more interesting. Some of the passages where God promises a future king or ruler sitting on the throne forever are very specific. For example, Micah 5.2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. So somebody's going to come from David who's going to sit on the throne and he will rule. Who's coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. Now, again, we have the advantage of knowing who was born in Bethlehem that fulfills this. Jesus. All they knew before the cross was this person, it's, they're going to be born in Bethlehem, but we have no idea who it is. Or how that pers- person could possibly reign forever. How is that even possible? Now, many times when we read this verse right here, we marvel at how specific God is. He tells everybody, that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. But what is easy to overlook is this right here, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Okay, as if the Davidic promise wasn't already crazy enough, there's going to come somebody from David who's going to sit on the throne forever over a kingdom that's going to last forever. Let's throw this in here. His coming forth is going to be from old, from ancient of days. Now, again, you and I know that. We know the answer to that. We have the answer key. That makes perfect sense. It's only God in the flesh who could fulfill this, but imagine living before this. They would have thought, what could this possibly mean? This person comes forth from ancient, from old, from ancient days. What does that mean? Was this person around when the world was created? 
Or, or perhaps his origins go back even further. Did he exist before the world was created in eternity past? And if he did exist in eternity past, how did he exist in eternity past? Was he created? Was he, was he eternal? How is this possible? Again, everybody before the cross, it would have been a mystery. But for you and me, we know exactly. But put yourself in their shoes just for a moment. Whoever this future ruler was going to be, this future ruler, this descendant of David, was going to be exceptional, to say the least, truly special. And this helps explain why, when Jesus came, so many people missed him and didn't see him for who he was. They were expecting a king, a ruler, somebody who would come and take charge and ascend to the throne, vanquishing Israel's enemies. But when the king came, he was born in a manger, not a palace. His parents were ordinary people, not noble elites. For heaven's sakes, he was raised in Nazareth. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? How could Jesus possibly be the fulfillment of God's promise to send a king, a ruler, a descendant of David who would sit on the throne forever? And folks, all of this leads to what I'm going to tell you. And what I'm about to tell you, you already know. But the reason I'm going to tell it to you again is because we, you and I, can never lose sight of this. Because the minute we lose sight of this is the minute that we miss God moving right before our very noses and we miss it. What is it that I'm going to tell you? Here's what it is. God will often fulfill his promises in, no one, in, in ways no one sees coming. Jesus is the perfect example of this. But the Bible is full of one example after another of God fulfilling his promises in ways nobody saw coming. Can I give you a couple examples? Abraham and Sarah. You're going to have a son. But what they didn't know is that Abraham was going to be 100 years old and Sarah 90 years old when this was fulfilled. Ladies, imagine having a child at 90 years old. Exactly. <laughs> Take Joseph in the Old Testament. He, God said, your brothers are going to one day bow before you. I promise you, your brothers are going to one day bow before you. So he goes and tells his brothers, you know, you're going you're gonna to bow before me. This is a promise of God. Little did Joseph know that he was going to be sold into slavery, end up in Egypt, in a prison, only then to rise to second in command over Pharaoh. Then there would be a famine in the land and his brothers would come from the promised land down to Egypt. And guess what? Bow before him. Little did he know that God was going to fulfill that promise through all of those means. God often fulfills his promises in ways no one sees coming. Why is that important for you and me? Here's why. You may look at the world right now and go, things are crazy. How in the world is God going to sort all of this out? I don't know. But any promise that you have in the Bible about what's going on in the world or God's sovereignty, God being in control, God working all things out according to the purposes of his will, folks, you never put a question mark at the end of one of God's promises. You put an exclamation point. Amen? And the same goes for your life personally. You might be looking at your life and struggling to believe the promises of God given what's in front of you or what you're going through or even where you've been and going, can I believe the promises of God with what's going on and what's been happening? Never put a question mark at the end of one of God's promises. You put an exclamation point and we believe it. Take this little promise, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. You want proof that God often fulfills his promises in ways no one saw coming? Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So before the Messiah comes, before this king, this ruler comes, Elijah will come first. Well, that should be pretty easy because when the Messiah comes, he's going to come in power and glory, right? No, he's going to come humble. Okay, well, then Elijah's going to appear. Surely he'll descend out of heaven or something until you find out that this is the guy that Jesus says fulfilled that promise. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. How in the world can that be Elijah? That can't be Elijah. He lives out in the desert. He's got no clothes. He eats funny things. As a matter of fact, John was such an unexpected fulfillment of this promise that Jesus even said to those in his generation, some of you are going to have a hard time believing it. Matthew 11 says this, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and this is what Jesus says, and if you are willing to accept it, because many of you won't, John is the Elijah who is to come. 
God often fulfills his promises in ways no one sees coming. And guys, that has bearing on you and me as we look at the world, as we look at our lives, or any other thing. Just remember that God is often at work in ways that we don't expect. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And that means when he fulfills his promises, leave room for him to work. Because if we don't, here's the, here's the danger when we don't do this, is God could be fulfilling his promises right under our noses and we miss it. And I don't want to be living in the 21st century going, I'm not sure God's being faithful. Do you? No, God's being faithful. The problem's not on his end. The problem's often on my end. That he has been faithful to me, nothing but faithful to me. And I think when we get to heaven, we're going to just realize just how faithful he was. Because we have limited minds right now. We have limited sight. We can only see so much. And so you think, if you think right now, God has always been faithful to me, multiply that times a billion or a trillion. That's how faithful he has been to you and to me. But I don't want God to be totally faithful to me right under my nose and me miss it. So I have to leave room for the fact that, God, you're often going to provide in ways that I don't see coming. Now, here's where things get really interesting regarding the promises of God that we find in the Bible. You want to know what's so fascinating about the promises of God in the Bible? This. For all the promises of God find their yes in him, that is in Christ. That is why through him, Christ, that we utter our amen to God for his glory. So according to Paul, every promise you see in the pages of scripture, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New, find their fulfillment in Christ, which is truly a mind-blowing statement. Every promise is fulfilled in Christ, every promise. Even if you can't connect the dots of how it's fulfilled in Christ, know this, it's fulfilled in Christ. Again, in some way, shape, or form, this is going to play itself out in the life of Christ. So for, take, for example, the Abrahamic covenant. We just looked at the Davidic covenant, and we know that the Davidic covenant is fulfilled in Christ, right? He is that ruler that was to come. But how about the Abrahamic covenant? You go, what's the Abrahamic covenant? God made promises to Abraham like this. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Could you imagine Abraham, this one guy going, wait a minute, how, are, how is everybody going to be blessed through me? How is that even possible? But again, we have the answer key. Galatians 3, and the scripture is foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. See, it doesn't matter if you have Abraham's blood running through your veins. What matters is that you have Abraham's, the faith of Abraham in your heart. Amen? And that's why if you have the faith of Abraham in your heart, you can say, I'm a child of Abraham. Right? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Yeah, we can sing that song because we are children of Abraham. Or take this part of the Abrahamic covenant. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Well, that sounds like he's going to give it to the physical people of Israel. Yeah, until we read this in the answer key. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. So whether it's the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, any promise you can find in the Bible, it finds its fulfillment in some way, shape, or form in Christ, whether you can connect those dots or not. Know this, it's fulfilled in Christ. And by the way, this also applies to the promises that God makes to his enemies. Let me give you one example of that. Genesis chapter 3. This is God cursing the serpent for having deceived Adam and Eve. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. That's a promise. And know this, he, this, the one that I'm going to send, the Messiah, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What does the answer key say? Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook in the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is the devil. Amen. Now, here's why this matters to you and me as Christians living in the 21st century. It, he, here it is. We are going to struggle to believe the promises of God. I don't care who you are. We're all, we all struggle to believe the promises of God. And if you're sitting here going today, going, <laughs> not me. 
I have super faith. I always believe the promises of God. I can, I'm going to put one verse on the screen right now that proves that every one of us struggles to believe the promises of God. Are you ready? Brace yourselves, because here it is. Therefore, do not be, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What's that word say? All. Here's the challenge, but seek first the kingdom of God, and here's the promise, and his righteousness, and here's the promise, and all these things shall be added to you as well. God says, seek me first. Make me the top priority in your life, and I promise you this. I will take care of your life. Folks, is that the greatest promise ever? I mean, think about it. If, 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 if somebody came to you and said, I'm going to be your personal manager. All you need to do is focus on living your life, and I'll take care of all the details. You'd go, that's the best thing ever. Now, imagine if that were God. It is. You have that promise. As crazy as that sounds, that you could have a personal butler or somebody like that, I hate to say it that way, that would take care of all the details. You have somebody greater than that, God, who says, if you'll seek me in first and my righteousness first, I'll take care of everything that you need, whether it be what you eat, drink, where it is you're going to sleep, I'll take care of all of it. But here's the kicker. He will often fulfill these promises in ways that no one saw coming. And I use this as an example. I, I told you guys, I get all of my shirts from garage sales or from Goodwill. I do. I, I make no bones about it. Um, oftentimes, and I'll add up my, my outfit at times, and it'll be like 12 bucks. It, it, it's amazing. Um, my best friend, Pat, who lives up in the Bay Area, I told you, he is like a professional garage sailor. He, he's a teacher, but he loves garage sailing, and so he buys me shirts all year round. And, um, and when I, him and his wife, we go on, my wife and him, we go on family vacations together, and so whenever we hook up, he's like, hey, I got a bunch of shirts for you. I didn't expect God to provide polo shirts from garage sales. <laughs> and again, I've mentioned this before, you, you might ask, why does Bill always roll up his sleeves? It's because the shirts I get often don't fit my arms. <laughs> and so it's the cheapest way to tailor. And so, yeah, you'll go, why is the sleeves always rolled up? It's because I got it from a garage sale. And I, this, is, this shirt, this polo right here, is from a garage sale. Folks, you can go to Goodwill. It's nothing but polo after polo after polo. Pennies on the dollar. This shirt is $100 every day at Macy's, right? I can get the same shirt at Goodwill for two bucks. I didn't expect God to provide that way, but he does. And you know the only difference between me and you? I make this shirt look good. <laughs> Sorry. I couldn't resist. Here's the pressing question today, folks. Is there a promise of God that you're currently struggling to believe? It might be the one that we just looked at. Seek me first and I'll take care of you. Just seek me first and I'll take care of you because the temptation is, no, Lord, I'm gonna take care of myself and then I'll give you the leftovers. No, seek me first and watch what, me, watch what I'll do. I'm gonna provide in ways that you didn't see coming. You might get your shirts from Goodwill, but you'll get your shirt nonetheless. I'm gonna provide the food you need. It may come in a way that you didn't expect, but that food will come. That shelter will come. I will provide for you. You have one job. Trust my promise. Seek me first and I will take care of everything else. Do you want to know some other promises that Christians often struggle with? Here's one. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Let me ask you a question. When your life is seemingly falling apart and you can't seem to catch a break and every decision you make seems to take things from bad to worse, will you believe this promise even then? Will you believe the promise that even if you're in a dungeon in Egypt, that God is at work? And that he is working all things for your good and his glory. Folks, we're living in a world that's fallen apart. What separates us from the world? It is the promises of God. It is the promises of God that even though the world might be out of control, even though my life might feel out of control, God's every bit in control. And he tells me not to be anxious about anything, what's going on in Europe or in other parts of the world, what's going on in the banking system. Don't be anxious about what's going on in my neighborhood or even in my own personal life. I got one job. Seek God's kingdom first and trust him. And know that even when he takes me down into a valley that seems scary down there, that even there, God is working all things for, his, for my good and his glory. 
Do we believe that promise? Let me give you another promise that Christians often struggle with. It's this one right here. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. How many Christians are living with guilt over sins that God promised were fully taken care of at the cross? In a room this size with this many people, with people watching online, I guarantee you there are people, and I've struggled with this one too, that sin, that thing that you've done or those things that you've done in your past will creep back into your thinking and you're going, Did, has God really forgiven me? Has he really forgiven me? Folks, do not put a question mark at the end of one of God's promises. You put an exclamation point and you believe it, right? Amen? You live free because as bad as whatever it is you've got in your past that you think is unforgivable, it's forgiven. You can't out sin God's grace. His grace is that great. His promises are that great. And when we believe the promises of God, it's when we live like different people in this generation. What does the world need from us? It doesn't need us to act like the world. It needs us to act like Christians, people who are walking in faith, believing the promises of God, even when things seem to be falling apart. Amen? Even when a pagan king hires a pagan sorcerer to curse Israel, God's in control and he's going to get his way. He always does. In every generation, he always does. So here's what I want to do, because we're out of time. I'm going to wrap up real quick. I'm going to give you four signs that you might be struggling with a pro to believe the promises, a promise or the promises of God. And these four are directly from my life. Okay, ready? Number one, lack of peace. A lack of peace is often directly related to our trust in the promises of God. I know for me personally, when I start feeling anxious, afraid, or worried, I can often go, okay, what am I not believing? And I'll trace it back to a promise of God that I have put a question mark at the end of instead of an exclamation point. So if you have a lack of peace, ask yourself, have I put a question mark at the end of a promise of God that should have an exclamation point? Number two is a lack of patience. In this case, we might not be struggling if God is going to fulfill his promise, but when. And so often I go, God, I know you're going to do it, but hurry up and do it, right? And I'm, I'm impatient, I'm impatient. I want it now. And God's like, hold on a second. I'm gonna fulfill it, perhaps, Bill, in ways you didn't see coming and when you least expect it. When you least expect it. The third is this, struggling with issues of control. This is the person, like myself, I, I'll say this to God, I will trust your promises, God, so long as I can maintain some control right? I'll seek your kingdom first, but just give me a little bit of control over the stuff that I need. I'll, I'll seek you 98% of the time, but I want 2% control. I'll seek you 95% of the time. Just give me 5% control. No, the promises of God are trust me all the way. Go all in. Let me be in control. Let my promises reign in your life. The last is this, underlying anger. Oftentimes, anger is nothing more than a lack of trust in the promises of God. There is no reason to be angry when you know that God is always in control and he always gets his way. His promises are always fulfilled. Why is that important? Because many of us are looking at the politics in this world, we're looking at the state of this world, and we're angry. We're angry because this bill isn't being passed, or that politician didn't get elected, or this is going on in the rest of the world. We're angry as if God's not in control and getting his way all the time. And that somehow God's not going to fulfill his purposes in this generation. Folks, don't be angry. Rejoice, because your God is a perfect promise keeper. And no matter how dire things look, God is in control, whether that be in the world or in your life personally. So if you want a verse to take with you this week, here it is. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? So the challenge is really easy. Ask God to strengthen your faith with regard to him being the perfect promise keeper, whether you're looking at the world or your own life, just tell yourself, he's the perfect promise keeper. No more question marks at the end of his promises, exclamation points. Let's pray.